fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. You are back in the House of Mystery, and of course I'm Al Warren. On the other side of the country, we got uh, we got it covered with Mr. <laughs> David Martino. How's it going over there? It's going well. Just waiting for a storm to to, to blow in. Oh, don't Trump yeah. come into town? No, just <laughs> <laughs> bum, bum, bum. no. Um, well, but yeah. Bum. Well, you're you're ready. You guys are used to that sort of thing. Oh yeah, it's New England. Yeah. So hey, but I'm not see. looking forward to it. So you know, <laughs> no, especially at your age, it's tough to get around. Yeah. It yeah. is. Get the wheelchair oh, out. terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with that. Wow. Okay. So anything. Uh, so, holy cow. I guess people are pretty upset about the M&Ms changing. I don't know oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. And, and now Mickey Mouse is wearing a pantsuit. <laughs> and Fox, I love it because that huh? Shaw woman on Fox News is making a big deal of it. While she's making a big deal of it, she's wearing a pantsuit. <laughs> <laughs> you have to laugh at all this. This is all yes. fun, people, because it really doesn't matter. You know, <laughs> you know I, I'd wear a pantsuit if I could get one. But <laughs> well, anyway, so now we are talking talking to an author from the UK. Now I see that over in the UK they do everything correctly, unlike here. Yes. So we're gonna we're gonna talk to someone that's rational. So, uh, Mr. William Shaw, thank you for being here. Thank you. I didn't know. Was I supposed to be wearing a pantsuit? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. This is the pantsuit episode. You know, yeah. I, everyone's these going thi- to pantsuits. These things are important on radio. Well, you know, um, if they think you're wearing a pantsuit, then they can dream of you wearing a pantsuit and then go from there. But, you know, David wears a dress too much. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> so, listen. It's I very think- freeing. <laughs> Let's talk. Okay, relax. Okay, calm down over there. Um, so, so William, um, you've been writing quite a while. I've noticed you've got quite a few books out, and it, very interesting. It looks like you have a pretty good following. Um, what got you into this kind of a life? Yeah, you know, I, I was a I was a journalist for years. Eight, you know, dreaming of being able to make stuff up. You know, um, because contrary to what people believe, journalists don't make stuff up. And, but I always wanted to be a fiction writer, and I always got into journalism really as a way to try and just get writing. But I always wanted to write stories. It just took me a very, very long time. Uh, and, you know, I found myself, you know, I, I had an agent because I was writing non-fiction books. And um, I kept sending him these attempts that I had of... of uh, of, of fiction, and he'd go, very, very nice. Thank you, William. Uh, keep on with the non-fiction. Uh, eventually, I wrote something that I kind of knew was good, and I, I, I sort of said, look, this time, this time, and, and I, that was, what, uh, 2012, 13, I, I finally, finally managed to uh, start writing fiction that, that, that other people enjoyed and I enjoyed. Uh, and, but, it, yeah, it was, it, was, it was, I'd always aimed to write fiction, and I tried it in the same way as I, I wrote all sorts of attempts of fiction. Finally, when I began writing this book and it was crime fiction, I thought, finally, I, I actually know what I'm doing at this point, um, kind of, anyway. Yeah. More than in, more, more than my previous attempts. Well, yeah, you don't know. I, when you do crime fiction, is this because of your journalism? Is it stuff that you covered and you brought it into your fiction? I don't think so in a weird way. I think crime fiction, yes, well, actually, no. That's, that's a really clever question because kind of actually I've done a contradict myself. Yes, I think <laughs> crime fiction is a kind of really interesting reportage. Um, my big theory about it is what you do is you do something completely unbelievable because you've got to scare the reader and make them believe that, that people are killing each other and things like that, which mostly doesn't happen. 
But what you do, how you do that is by you convince them of the real stuff. So you make a real place and you might put some real controversies in there or some real background, stuff that as a journalist I still quite like researching. And then you kill people. Once you've suckered people into your real world, then you can, then you can start doing nasty things. So, we, yeah, it's a kind of hybrid form. Actually, now you've now you've put that thought in my brain. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I think quite often um, when we write stories, especially if they're fiction, it, it's got to involve us somehow in order to bring it to life, make it real. And so, a, a lot of what we do, even without thinking, it's got to be incorporated in how we write. Yeah. I, I totally agree. I mean, my long sort of version of it is that I think crime fiction started with j just being a sort of just a fantasy and just a puzzle and just a mystery. And certainly in Europe, it began to then sort of lose its audience and be people began to think, I can't believe in the sort of just everybody's in the vicarage and somebody's dead. That's no longer. So people began to make it more and more realist so that you'd believe in the death part, so you believe in the puzzle. And actually, that realist part of it has actually got more and more interesting. And it's like Ian Rankin, who says, if you're going to go and visit a foreign country, pick up a guidebook, sure, but if you really want to get into that country, pick up a local crime fiction writer and read about it. You'll understand something bigger about the society through reading that than you would yeah. do a normal normal, um, you know, uh, guidebook. Well, you've you got to think, too. I mean, in America, for sure, um, even Canada, for that matter, there's there's a real... Um, how do I say, it's not distrust, but there's a real um, thought that uh, there's not always real justice involved. Like a lot of times when you get into crime and justice in the system, um, people are always upset or disappointed in how the outcome is. Like some people get away with it, some people, you know, in technicalities or, you know, this person gets a four-year sentence and he murdered someone. Meanwhile, someone doing... Um, pot it's like in for 13 years so there's this real uh, you know um unsettled rest i guess it's just not uh, people are not real happy with it and so when you write these crime fictions and also when people read it isn't it a way of controlling that where there is actually justice in the at the end of the book see i would say that's the fundamental difference between american crime fiction traditions and and European ones. And I think, perhaps, I, I think there is a, there's a narrative about justice in America that's really interesting. And it is about that kind of justice. I think in Britain, in Britain, it's more about, especially in detective fiction, is the detective really isn't investigating the crime. He's really investigating society itself. Do you know what I mean? He's looking at, at that kind of thing. And I think there's a real fundamental difference in it because the whole notion of uh, an individual an individual's vengeance is really important in American fiction. Actually, the vengeance is often kind of never quite works, does it? There's always it, you're kind of going for it, but it still doesn't quite work. And I think that's a similar thing. You know, like you what you'd want it to be right, but the, the, the PI or the detective or whatever doesn't ever succeed in making it quite right, do they? No. They make some of it right. Yeah. Well, I, I would guess that would mean then the subtext. You know, because a lot of American writers will be writing crime fiction, and there's, it's about getting justice. It's about the justice system. There's always the subtext about what's right and wrong with justice. So I guess, in a sense, when you're writing British crime fiction or mystery, it's more about the society than it is the justice system. Yeah, I think somebody said that cleverer than I did, and I can't remember who it was, but this, the, the, the whole thing about the detective is the detective isn't really investigating the crime. They're in, in, investigating the whole milieu in which the crime happens, in, in especially you know, in a lot of that contemporary British or European crime fiction. Oh, there you go. He's speaking French now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you like that. <laughs> <laughs> these, these, these cultured Brits. You know, <laughs> they're right out there, you know. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I guess, I guess that's it. You're kind of um, writing in that sense. Do, do you intentionally put then a, a subtext in your story? So underneath the story of this person and that mystery and this murder and all this stuff, but under it all, at the end of the book, am I taking away something, some sort of statement or subtext? Well, it's the wrong thing to admit to doing, isn't it? Yeah. Because actually it's all entertainment and that's all that it should be. But yes, I do. And I, I do, and I do it partly because it's how I, how I, I think it comes from the journalism thing, but also I find it really good to have a thematic thing before I start and to know what 
I'm looking at in terms of theme, and it can be really anything, but it just helps me turn a, turn something into a story. So kind of I do, and uh, but, you know, on the other hand, the, the last thing a crime fiction should be is didactic or sort of moral in that sense, you know, because really they're just fun, and that's they're supposed to be fun. So I'm I'm now sort of saying don't don't read my books. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we know. Yeah. Well, you know, you said you were um, you know proficient at nonfiction, doing journalism, but and and, and books, but uh, uh, fiction is a you know different sort of a craft. Um, what did you do to uh, improve? Did you uh, have a process that you used to um, to improve your fiction? Are you saying um, it's bad? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, well, yeah, it needs work. <laughs> no, no, in, in the beginning, because you. Were, yeah, it's no, fun. it's interesting. I just think I, I think you know, fiction is is really clever, isn't it? Storytelling mm. is 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 actually, you know, I'm just amazed at how many journalist colleagues I meet. meet you know, you meet them a few years later, and 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 they say, "How do you do that?" And I'm going, but this but making up stories seems relatively easy sometimes compared to writing a, a, a long form bit of nonfiction, but. Um, in terms of, I still couldn't do it right at the beginning. So I think, you know, what I did, I mean, the, really the trick that I did right at the beginning is I used to co- copy out huge bits of books I liked because I couldn't understand how they did it. And I just used to sit there and actually type out paragraphs thinking that if I copy them, maybe something, I'll understand how this feels to write it or something. Because I think that's the thing, you know, it's, it's a, it, fiction is a craft where you need empathy, don't you? You need to sort of yeah. be able to put, and, I, and I, I kind of I think it took me a long term to lo- long time to learn how to do it. I've got lots of juvenilia that lasted till I was about forty something, you know. Suddenly, I be- began to figure out how I could write, and it was a whole different, um, you know, way of way of going forward. Oh, that's so, great too, because I had uh, I, I just never had the patience to do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, and also just you know they say reading and stuff like that. It's kind of true, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know. Also, being more grown up. I mean, I, I think I was quite immature, uh, and I, it, I I see the jealousy when people who are twenty come out with what they know, what the, you know, come out with perfect novels. Because mm. how do they do that? You know, mm. it took me a long time before I found I had anything worth saying in that sort of sense. Journalism, you're already you're relying on a real world that's already there, aren't you? You're kind of, you know, you've got a story, you go out and get it because um, it's already there. But when you have to make stuff up, I think yeah, I think you just you know. It took me a very, very long time to find my voice. So you're telling us you have no empathy? None, none. <laughs> <laughs> it just well, took me a long time to operate it, to operationalize it, work out how I could get into people's. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's you know. Well, then, how do you do it then? Like, and and I'll say this, um, you see, because I've written primarily nonfiction, mm. so my idea is all true crime and or it's about cults and stuff. So it's like you said, the world is there. I'm not creating these characters. I'm just trying to uh, pass on how they behave or what they say and do um so how do you go about starting a story like this like all of a sudden creating something that's not real i i am by the sound of it oh you also write some fiction and and i think you know like the thing interesting about fiction is they they carry on writing fiction i mean there was times when i when i knew i wasn't going to get anything published you just carry on writing it and it's that point uh, and then you learn how eventually you can write a long story as opposed to a short story but with crime books, I generally start with a. It's it's not it's it's just a conviction around a book, and I think a lot of people feel a similar kind of way. Um, I wrote a book called um, Salt Lane, which is a, a detective fiction set in a bit of um, coast that's a bit like Holland. It's a bit it's in the Kent coast where they where they drained the landscape a thousand years ago. They started draining it. Even the Romans did some drainage on there. And I, I wanted to write that about that landscape, and I just knew that I was going to write a book set there, so I began looking at the landscape. I went and, gone, went and met two people who run the drains in this place. They are responsible for keeping most of these drains open. I just went along and thought, if I go and have a chat with them, maybe an idea for a book will come out of them. And I sort of said, look, you know, I've got no idea what I'm doing here, and it's really rude to ask you because you've got proper jobs keeping the water out of this bit of the country. Could you tell me where, if I wanted to put a body in one of your <laughs> your uh, bits of water, where would I do it? And I thought I'd said, said the rudest thing in the world, but they both leapt up, took me to another room with this gigantic map showing all their waterways on it, and said, well, we found one here there was another one here and you could if one was put here you wouldn't find it for like a year and then they began explaining 
what they were doing and how these delicate levels of water were kept and you let in certain bits of water and you kept out others. Now, this is on the south coast. And I was doing this in the run up to something we had over here called Brexit was very much about how we we keep people out of Britain and stuff like that. And I just thought, well, there's my book. It's all this is going to be a book about illegal migration and also about keeping water out of Britain in the same way, because for a thousand years we've been letting some water in there and keeping it out and trying to stop it. But the water always still gets in. You still get floods. And at the same time, we're completely preoccupied, as you have been in the States as well, about what sort of migrants you want. And I just thought, so, okay, what do you look for there? You look for um, you look for poor farms who need workers and you find out what what the crime's happening around there. And so within just like about an hour of that meeting, I had I wouldn't say I have the plot because I never have the plot. I find that such a struggle. But, you know, I thought that's a book. Yeah. Well, wow, that's interesting. Wow. So, and they, so they told you where the bodies were. Or, or yeah. maybe they thought you were someone that had some bodies to dump. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, maybe they make money. They make service, couldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're not making enough money from this drainage business. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's going to be another 100 quid. Right? Let's get going here. Um, well, anyway. That's it. But now, so the characters, how do you, how do you, um, and I ask this, I don't want to get, because a lot of fiction writers, they either have one or two, they hear voices in the head, they hear their, their uh, characters, the characters are like real people, they'll say they're like my family, like my kids, or they have all these, you know, different descriptions, while other authors say, no, I just write it, come, just, I don't feel anything. Where do you stand? Probably more with the latter. I mean, I'm a terrible writer. I don't write very consistently in any kind of way. It just sort of, um, I don't even spend, you know, I tend to write in little snatches and and sort of do it. I never really have a plan and I never really, if I was thoughtful enough about these characters at the beginning, I probably wouldn't lead myself into so many drafts. But I do think, you know, a character comes out of the landscape maybe or the situation or the need. You know, you write one character. It's always this way and I'm sure all crime writers, you write a, a main character and out of that main character another character will emerge because that main character needs somebody to argue with so you've got a sec- you know so some of it's functional about what the book needs uh, and um some of it's is is just a bit random that they take on characteristics isn't it i mean it tends to be quite haphazard and um characters can often change and they might change gender or background and i i have to keep i i go out and google photographs and i have to keep them in my notes because by the end of the book I've suddenly realized the character's changing some, somebody else halfway through and I've changed their hair color and so I've got to find some way of reining it in and making them one person all the way through. Um, so that's, again, it's, 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 it's the, I'm coming over like a hopeless writer, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> but your characters, uh, they, they actually surprise you as you're going through the process. Hopefully, yeah, I love that. And I know that sounds really sort of um, indulgent to say, but they do write themselves very much into that sort of situation, the dialogue appears. Once they begin to, to talk on the page, then it's really great. And they do. I mean, you know, I think that's the nice thing. And I did a lot of work uh, as a journalist on with um, writing narrative nonfiction and uh, uh, particularly, um, uh, I've forgotten the name for it. What's it? Just when it's spoken, uh, like, uh, you know, I use people's voices. I'd tape them forever and then I'd edit the tapes and I'd just really use people's voices. And I think that's really important to me because I realize how idiom- idiosyncratic everybody's voices are and how much comes through speech. I do very dialogue heavy stuff and um, the words people use and they won't use and the illogicality of how people speak um, really is part of their characters. Uh, yeah, mm. uh, I, I like a lot of that. So, so, so dialogue's important to you. Yeah, um, I mean, it's great for crime, though, isn't it? Because it also moves things fast. Yeah, yeah, I, I, think, it's, I think it's the best way. But yeah. um, when you're doing dialogue, with today's kind of modern style of um, political correctness and stuff, do you, have, do you find yourself watching how you write the dialogue? My first book was actually set in the 1960s, in 1968 in London. It was a book, in the States it came out, She's Leaving Home, and it was set in 1968, which I'm old enough to remember. And people's dialogue was pretty unallowable (laughs) on those. Uh, You know, the words people used were not good. Uh, uh, And I found it a really interesting responsibility to use those words, but to contextualize them in the way that that was was absolutely sure that that wasn't what the book thought, but that's how people spoke. And they did speak, and it would have been a lie to say they didn't speak like that. 
Um, and actually, in some ways, the book was saying, look, we've changed, and that's a good thing. But it was absolute, it was a really liberating thing for me to go back and remember how we were spoken to in those days and to be able to use those words and use it back against almost those times, you know, because everybody says, hey, the swinging 60s, they were really great. Well, in lots of ways, they weren't so cool, where I was from anyway, <laughs> you know, and so it's quite nice using some very, very bad words um, in that way. And there are words, obviously, I wouldn't use in the political correctness. I totally understand it. I mean, there's words that, that communities will not have used, and I'm, I'm totally down that. But, you know, you can use a lot of stuff that really show, that, that indicates what was being spoken in that time. And I think it's, it's quite good to remind yourself um, that there's nothing very clever or witty about the, the characters who are using them, but it was there. Well, you write a lot about uh, the 1960s. Uh, wh what about that decade draws you to, to it, to, to, to create fiction about that time period? I, I joined a writer's group in 2000, um, and uh, there's another writer on, on the, in the group, and he's really, really huge in the UK now, and his name's C.J. Sanson. And he's a, he's a historical novelist. He's not so big in the States, but really, really big. He's one of the biggest writers in, in Britain now. Damn his eyes. Um, but um, he wrote historical fiction. And I, I sort of was quite drawn to that. But I thought, I can't do historical fiction because Chris, C.J. Sampson, is, is doing historical fiction. But I've been a music journalist as well. I started as a music journalist. And I thought, what if you could write cultural fiction, which sounds really, really, really poncy as an idea. But what I meant was actually go back to that cultural time in 1968 and, and have it as it was, because, uh, you know, it wasn't all swinging groovy. Uh, you know, I remember that I lived in Devon in 1960, in the 1960s, which was about as close to the 1940s as you could possibly get. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember the Beatles came to the town next to ours. We used to live on, on an, uh, an estuary. And on one side of the estuary, there was a tiny little village. And on the other, there was a tiny little town. The Beatles came to the tiny little town while they were doing Magical Mystery Tour in their, in their painted bus. And so we rode across the estuary, me and my sisters, full of excitement to go and hang out because the Martians had landed. You know, it was the weirdest thing. You know, there was nothing anywhere in our town that remote, that was anything like 1967 at the time. We were still living in, in some sort of weird, you know, sort of throwback. And I wanted to do that kind of 60s. The 60s was, you know, like there's that great quote, as the future is unevenly distributed. Well, the past was really unevenly distributed. You know, Britain was really still post-war poor in 1967. And, you know, half there were still bomb sites in London. And yet everywhere is saying, hey, the Beatles are really groovy. We're all swinging. Well, they were swinging around the King's Road um, and around Carnaby Street. But pretty much everywhere else was still stuck in some really weird, different um, era. And I thought it'd be really fun to write into that period and therefore sidestep the competition with Chris by doing it more about the sort of cultural change. Because when I was growing up, like my dad's generation, they kind of had pipes and slippers and they were, uh, you know, they started a job at 20 and they carried on till they were 65. And that was the one job they did, you know, and suddenly there was this big change around the 60s and there was a big generational divide. I thought, what if I put my detective is somebody or other from that generation who's just a good man who is in his 30s and the 30s, you're middle aged in 1968 uh, and put him with a 22 year old young woman who loves pop music. And, and so that was the sort of thing because it seemed to me there was a real cultural sch schism around the time and of course you what you expect the um, older guy to be wrong about everything but in some ways he can be really critical about some of the stuff that's going on in the um amongst the younger generation and the sort of individualism uh so anyway yeah, yeah. That, that was kind of you know what what i've forgotten the question but that's that's um <laughs> it was a rich answer wasn't it yeah <laughs> yes, it was well you know that, that's that's interesting because you're 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 kind of taking um, note in your books of how the generations were and the culture were, how it was changing in the sixties, just like it did in the seventies, eighties, nineties, and and now. Yeah, but there was a year zero in the sixties, which there never was again. Right. You know, I mean, there really was a complete. You know, if you like trad jazz, you know, you were suddenly gone. Whereas now, you speak to it. In fact. You know, for the last two or three decades, there's not been that cultural thing. It's sort of taken – obviously, people change. And there's different attitudes maybe about gender or stuff like that. But there was an absolute year zero after that point. The, the new sort of affluent generation kind of had a completely different cultural viewpoint, and that was just really fun because what you want is conflict, isn't it, between your two 
two protagonists. Yeah. You know? Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. Um, now, I noticed now your your last book here, the one that came out in May 13th, 2021, uh, The Trawler Man. Ooh. Yeah. Now, that's hard for me to say. Um, now, Trawler Man. <laughs> what, what, so I know what it is because I looked up on Google. Now, <laughs> what made you go that direction for a title? Wow. Is that a hard, you know, that's really interesting because, I, you know, I hadn't realized. Is that a very yeah, it's something U.S. That, unfriendly title? Well, it's not that it's unfriendly. Yeah, it's just something that, I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's just me, but um, I lived in Seattle. There's lots of boats and fishermen there, but I don't know. I, I never really, like, it hit me, and I thought, well, Trawler Man. Does and, it sound at all sinister? Well, no, no, it just sounds strange, doesn't it? It's, it's just, it just sounds strange where I wanted to make sure I knew what it was before I got into the interview, which is kind of, it shouldn't be because it should be fairly simple. I mean, what was what's, what's your thought, Dave? Did you know what it was already? Am I just stupid? No, no, I, I don't think I had heard that term. Yeah, wow. it's, not a, it's not a common term. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Well, if only I'd known that. <laughs> oh, no, no. Two, we're, we're separated by the same language, aren't we? Yeah. No, it's true. It's, it's not. A, it, I'm not saying it's. A, I mean, obviously, you've, you've you've done well with it. Or, I mean, it looks like you've got a lot of reviews and you're doing well. So, it's not that. It was just like it was like through me. That's all. Yeah. Okay. I mean, a trawler man is is a is is it's a very common word, especially now. Uh, it's been in the news a lot here. It's a fisherman. It's a fisherman working generally out of small boats um, commercially catching fish and, and, and lobsters and, and the like. And uh, it's very been, you know, as we're a country who's become obsessed with our borders over Brexit, the trawler industry has been one of those sort of frontier industries about who's, fish, who's coming to catch our fish, who can we stop catching our fish, where can we fish. So it was kind, it's kind of an issue word around here. Because um, mm. uh, I've written this series, um, and they're all set in the county of Kent, which is on the southeast um, but if if you imagine England, Scotland, uh, and Wales, and Ireland as a kind of somebody sitting at a car and Ireland's the steering wheel, um, Kent's the arse, basically. It's the bit facing France at its closest. It's the Do White Cliffs of Dover. And it's got a really interesting mentality as a county. It's facing France. And in some ways, a lot of the politics that have come from there uh, have been the ones that have, have fed Brexit. They are, they are the, they've had centuries of fighting a borderland fighting because they're the first place that's invaded and if you go around that coast around the South Kent coast it's full of fortifications there's Napoleonic era fortifications there's Roman era hill forts and it's generally still thinking that way that we've got to work out who we keep out of that place which was the, the second book in that, that thing was Salt Lane I started writing about this lovely little landscape called Dungeness which is a, a, it's a spit that goes out into the channel and it's a spit made of shingle um, and it's, the, I think it's one of the, if not the biggest shingle bank in the world, certainly the biggest in Europe. And it's because there's, there's so much current goes up and down the channel, it draws all the shingle out of those white cliffs and it puts them in this big triangle that goes out there. And these wonderful eccentric people have built little wooden houses on there over the work. work. They, they kind of live in little shacks and shanties along there. And so I, I've set my books along that bit of coast. Um, and, you know, they're all from a, from the point of view of a detective who's left London and found herself in this strange kind of world and is trying either to fit in or not fit in. Um, and I kind of thought I'd done three or four books from the point of view of looking out at the sea and the sea was always there. And I thought, OK, it's time to look back from the sea. Uh, and I'd heard this story. I live in Brighton, which is a bit for, about 50 miles further down the coast on the channel. And I'd, I'd been doing a piece of journalism, actually, and I, I met a woman who, who worked in one of the arches on the seafront um, selling smoked fish. And, I, and she was quite an elderly woman. I spoke to her and said, oh, yeah, my husband was lost at sea. He was a trawlerman, to use that word. And, um, and it, they'd never found his body. Um, but at the same time, I was actually having an affair with another man. And I, I couldn't marry him after my husband disappeared because in this country, and I don't, there's probably a similar law there, you have to wait for seven years. If you don't find the body, you have to wait for seven years um, before you can actually be declared dead. And, and I, that story was in the back of my head. And kind of I held up that story and eventually I thought, you know, if, you, if that's happened to you, there's going to be a lot of people suspecting that you somehow had a hand in your husband's death. Uh, and so that's where the, 
germ of this story really came from. Um, and it's kind of really about that community of fishermen around a place called Folkestone and, um, and that bit of coast and the, and the bad things that happen. Well, I just wanted to add that, you know, with the title, uh, The Trawler Man, uh, you know, I, I think that good fiction, you know, asks and answers questions. And if someone doesn't know that what that uh, term is, uh, like let's say in the States, or maybe it's just me and Al, <laughs> you know, it, it, it creates this question and intrigue, and uh, it, it makes you want to pick up the book. Oh, it's a, obviously a genius title at that point. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, good save. Good save. <laughs> good save. Well, you, hey, you know what I did here? I, have you been watching that on the news with the Irishmen going to go out and challenge the Russian um, little war games that they're going to do in the economic zone? Wow. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's just coming up, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Man. Yes, yeah. I know. It's um, there'll, there'll also be a great movie in that in about five years' time, won't there? I mean, there's yeah. a whole... Well, it depends how it ends. <laughs> you know, because uh, I don't know what what's going to happen with that. That could that could turn out pretty ugly. You know. Yeah, yeah, you know. and and the Irish Navy is not really a, a match for um, the Soviet well, Navy. Well, yeah. the Russian Navy. Yeah, they got one boat, don't they, or something? That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's not good. But anyway, I found that to be interesting. There's so much going on that we could take from. So, you know, amazing. Now. Um, now, your main character, like you've got, uh, if I understand, so you have a uh, detective, right? Yeah, it's a, a detective called Alex Cooper. She's the one who's come down from London, and she's left London under a cloud. Every every police force in the, the UK has always traditionally hated the Met Police, which is London's police office. So if you move from the Met to somewhere more rural, you're going to be met with a certain amount of suspicion. And she's a single parent, as you know, as all the best detectives are. And uh, she's bringing up a, a fantastically troublesome daughter um, who is mainly troublesome because when she arrives there, she actually becomes a naturalist. And this is so baffling to her mother. You know, she's a, a, a misfit child. She'd understand her daughter if she hung around shopping malls and um, drank alcohol. But actually, she's really, she's become, she becomes obsessed with the. It's a very rich place in natural history around there. And she becomes completely obsessed with natural history and spends a lot of time hanging around with older men which would sound very dodgy but they're all they're all absolutely sweet and innocent they're just teaching her about the nature around so you've got this this mother who doesn't understand her child at all for all the wrong reasons as my main protagonist wow so how do you write um this is this is another thing that people i don't know sometimes they're complaining about now just it seems like every day um about actors you know how can you play a gay actor if you're not gay. How could you play a woman or how could you play a, a black person? So how is it for you to write dialogue as your female character? Well, I was, I was actually quite worried about that. I was always all right to write secondary characters. And I can remember talking to um, women crime writers about this. And they said, if you are sure that you can get your characters talking in the places where men can't go together. You know, so you put two women in a place where men can't go and having that conversation between two women, if you get that right, and it's not all about saying, you know, comparing underwear tips and bra sizes, then you're, you know, you're probably heading in the right direction. And I actually took that quite seriously because the first, when I realized what I did later, the first time I made, I brought this detective on was actually in the women's restrooms in the police station where they're talking about something that's going to happen. And I think that's actually quite a good clue is if you can get the conversation between women to sound realistic, um, yeah. then, then you can do it. But in theory, we all ought to be able to do that, shouldn't we? I mean, we're not a million miles away from each other as genders. So, you know, uh, we ought to be able to imagine ourselves into each other's heads. To that extent. Well, yeah. and it, yeah. I know it's a bit of a hot topic these days about how far you can go. But surely the gender thing is something we ought to feel. And I have two older sisters. That helps. Yeah. Mm. Well, you, you can just hang out in the woman's bathroom, too, at the shopping. <laughs> <laughs> Pick up stories, you know. They'll probably arrest you. But, mm. you know, it's an idea. It's all research. <laughs> it's all research. <laughs> Do you like the, the modern day time with publishing now, with, the, with everybody self-publishing and the small publishers and, and Amazon and things like that? Do I like it? It's the weather, isn't it? Yeah. yeah you know, I, don't I, think, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think things have ever been advantageous for writers. I don't think there's ever been a golden age. Uh, and I think 
I think um, having a slightly commercial eye on the way things are going is very useful. It's great working in a popular fiction genre because you do have to think about what readers want, stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's not pretty in lots of ways. Um, I'm very interested in bookstores, uh, and I think they're really an interesting... At the same time as you've got the Amazon landscape, bookstores seem to be doing... I don't know what it's like in the States, but they seem to be doing all right in the last two or three years. People are liking books as things, and they're willing to actually pay more money for them this year than they were the previous year. So I'm not complaining. People always say, why are crime writers quite nice? And, and it's the, the standard answer is because well, we get the badness out of, each, out of it in the book. I think it's because we're actually writing in quite a successful genre. And actually, you know, it's quite nice to know that there are actually are readers there for what we do. So... I think I'm in the kind of golden age, slightly. Oh, well, so you're all dressed up and yeah, in my um pantsuit. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there you go. No, I just I'm, I'm interested because it it also leads to a lot of competition that's kind of unexpected and a lot of people that put things out that maybe aren't to the same standard. There there are more terrible books being published now than there have been since probably the 30s when there was also, 20s and 30s, there was a peak in, you know. I mean, Pulp had produced some of the best books, of you know, my, my most loved books, and some of the worst books ever, you know. Um, and we're in, that, we're in a similar kind of situation, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. It seems that way, you know. Um, but, there's a know, lot of rubbish out there. Well, yeah. There is there is a lot of rubbish out there, and you can get rubbish that sells significant quantities, and you can sit there being very bitter about it, or just think, well, that's keeping bookshops and keeping the supply chains going. Yeah, yeah. I think there's become a real separation, but I think uh, the major publishers and stars are kind of focusing on the chain bookstores and not so much online. And self-publishing is kind of going toward Amazon and online. So I think there's separation there, but it's it's not the same. It's not the same thing. There's not the gatekeeper on the Amazon books. No, there's not. I would I would have to say I would. I, I mean, I've got friends who are very successful and very good writers in the you know, ebook world. You know, and it's straight to ebooks either through you know Thomas and Mercer, which is Amazon's publisher, or through other things. And they're absolutely brilliant. They're really thriving on that. I would kind of. Um, you know, hate to ha almost have to work as hard as they have to do because it's a more fickle audience. And I think one of the great things about the bookshop audience is they're quite loyal to, to authors as brands. Uh, and, you know, OK, the, the, the rewards might not be so great sometimes because if you get a huge, you know, ebook sale, you can make a lot of money and, 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 and do well. But, you know, you then have to work equally hard to keep your head above the parapet for the next book. Um, and it's so they're very different audiences, and I think that you know the ebook audience will quite often go for a cover that's quite similar to the last one they went, rather than one by the same author. Yeah. So you, you mentioned going to white writers groups. I can't even speak. Yeah, and <laughs> and um, what is that something you would suggest? Like if a brand new writer or a person that's writing but hasn't chosen to publish yet, or and is looking to get into it, is that something you would suggest to start with? You know, I've just run a project in Brighton. It was a brilliant project. It's called The Bookmakers. Uh, and if you've got a minute, I'll just tell you about this because it kind of answers this question. Yeah. It was it was the idea that I've got a – I wanted to do a pop-up shop in Brighton. It was a bookshop. I visited so many independent bookshops, and they're thriving here. But, but they're thriving because they're social businesses. They they connect with local schools, with local writers groups, with local readers groups, uh, with libraries. Uh, they have stopped just selling stuff. They've started being part of a, a kind of – of community of writers and readers uh, and that's how they've thrived and I thought what well, if you can take that as a model and do it for six months in a shop and just say okay we're going to do a shop where I'm going to invite 10 15 writers I know who are successful I'm going to say I'm going to stock your books in this shop but you're going to come along and you're going to teach some underrepresented writers or some writers who are struggling to tutor them you're going to just evangelize for the shop you're going to get them and we're going to do workshops we're going to do events so for six months we did that and what was really interesting about it is that time and time again, you get people coming in and you say to them, are you a writer? And they go, uh, no, 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 I'm not. A and they, are, you, are you a writer? And they say, well, actually, I am. And once they come out of their shell, they tell them all this thing and they bring out their self-published things. 
And you'd kind of say, I wish you'd connected. I just wish you'd joined up with other people because it's a really complicated thing, getting this thing you love and have been trying to do for years and can spend years in your garret writing um, out into the world. And actually, the biggest intelligence is the hive mind of writers. You know, you will learn so much from talking to other writers just about saying, you know, if you're going to self-publish, you've got to market, you've got to get the cover right, you've got to get actually your spelling and grammar is quite important. You know, you can be a brilliant writer, and there's some brilliant writers who I know who are severely dyslexic and, and you know, who have all those issues. I know one of the writers who came to us didn't learn to write, didn't learn to read, sorry, till she was in her late 20s. Her writing is phenomenal. But, you know, you know, obviously she's quite naive about some of the things. Hook the mother up with other writers and just talk and form communities. And we can do that now. You know, it's very easy to form communities of writers. But the, the biggest advice is just meet other writers and would-be writers and, and hook up with them and share stuff. And then get really offended when they say bad stuff about your writing. But actually then <laughs> winnow out the ones that, that are negative and, and you don't think have got what you were trying to get at. But, you know, it's... it's uh, the publishing industry is entirely horizontal. They'll deal with you one-to-one, -one, but actually as writers, we've got to connect across the board and it makes us much more um, knowledgeable, more powerful. And, you know, it's, it's brilliant becoming a writer because you can then talk to other writers, uh, you know, and they tell you all this sort of stuff about how they write, you know, and that's fantastic. But yeah, it's, 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 um, it's, it was really great watching lots of people who hadn't connected with other writers connect and just realize how much they could learn just from talking to each other. Yeah, well, and if someone is saying bad things about your writing, you just go online and give them one-star reviews. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you. Yeah. Well, you know, do you, how, do you, how do you respond with one-star reviews, or do you or do you even follow it? Um, I don't guess any. What do you mean one-star reviews? <laughs> well, let me fix that. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that right now. <clears throat> no, I, I, you I know. am. You know, I'm so glad I was quite grown up when I became a writer. I, you know, it's the other reason why I worry about, you know, why I feel for 20 year olds or something who come into it. You know, it's good to have a thick skin. I know what I'm trying to do, and if somebody doesn't get it, as far, you know, I did a lot of stuff going to to um to um reading groups and stuff like that, which I found really interesting because it was never my thing that you talked about books with other people. But when I realised people did, I got really into it. I began going to loads of these groups. And it's just fascinating. You sit in one group and there's 10 people in a room and it's like they've read 10 different books. So if one person hates it and wants to give it one star, that's fine. As, you know, as long as somebody gives it five stars somewhere. <laughs> yeah, something that gets balanced out, you know, you know. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's, it, you do have to have a thick skin because you've got to have some self-belief in it. Um, yeah. and, and, and nobody, you, the idea of the public having a say in what books were is entirely new, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of people I have to hunt down. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible, right? I mean, it's just uh, it's scary. Um, so, so listen, um, someone that's never heard of you before, which I find this hard to believe, but they've, <laughs> they've never heard of you before, uh, or you're in fancy pants suit, um, and they and they want. And there was one book that they had to get just to find out what kind of a writer you are. Which book would you tell them to pick up of yours? I would say a book called The Bird Watcher, um, which is a book. It was the first book I set in Kent, and it was the book I learned. You know, it was a, I think it was my fourth book, and it's the kind of book where I feel I learned how to write to a, a better level. Uh, and it kind of – it's really about um, a – it starts off with saying uh, William South um, – I can't even quite remember, but the, the first paragraph said William South didn't want to be part of the murder investigation. Sergeant William South didn't want to be, because because the birds were starting to migrate and he wanted to watch them, and it was September, and he also didn't want to do it because he was a murderer himself. Uh, and it's about this person who's committed a murder and yet is now a fully operational police force, and he's, fig he's always done nice community policing and just keeping, the, keeping people safe and keeping things going and returning stolen bicycles, and suddenly this circumstance forces him to become part of a murder investigation and it makes him have to confront something he did when he was a juvenile. Well, that first line is, is so important to, and to, to, to draw the reader in. It's the only good one I've ever written, though, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you've written one. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It is. I mean, I think, 
you know, I'm very aware of that, and I, I kind of am incredibly envious of people who write these perfect concepts that will, in which you can hang everything. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm envious, and I'm also resistant because sometimes those aren't the books I like most. You know, I'm wondering, uh, have you noticed any uh, in, in in all of your work any motifs, anything that repeats in your work, maybe that was unconscious and maybe became conscious as as you began to. Uh, uh, as the stories began to unfold? That's a really great question. And actually, the motifs are that, you see, I'm a completely ineffectual male. Um, I would never throw myself into any heroic situation uh, <laughs> or, or um, do anything brave. I'm always the last to challenge um, authority when I know I should. And actually, my books are full of characters who are a bit like that. That's not a good thing. It's very un-American. <laughs> and actually, uh, you know, where men are supposed to be decisive and things like that, but I quite like that whole thing about, you know, the thing when you know you ought to act, but you haven't. Mm. Right, right. It's most of the country. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, what's your fa- who is your favorite writer? I, that's kind of a generic question but uh, do you get inspired by other writers how's that well i guess that you know in that favorite writer thing and i wouldn't say they were favorite any longer because i'm i'm not but raymond carver had a massive 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 influence on me at that time in your 20s when you need somebody to be a massive massive influence and it's really useful in crime fiction because you know that sort of american realism where you just show what people are you don't say what people are thinking you can only see the surface of them, which is very much the the way of that sort of um, classic, you know, American short story writing is so useful in crime fiction. Um, uh, and I, I, you know, I also love, you know, they were. I can remember reading. I was reading The Mill and the Floss by George Eliot and what we what we talk about when we talk about love simultaneously. And I can remember thinking, one of these is me, and one of them really isn't me at all. And I loved Mill on the Floss. It's a fantastic book, but it was just like so full of inner interior monologue. And I was thinking, I don't have any interior monologue. Mine is entirely missing. Whereas I totally get Raymond Carver's sort of things where people act, uh, and you don't see why they've acted. They just act. Hmm. Interesting. And, of course, um, my writing's changed your life too, right? Oh, oh God. (laughs) You know. Uh, you know, I didn't want to embarrass you. <laughs> you always, always mention the host. Come on. You know, that's it. So um, now how do you like to interact with your uh, listeners? Um, like, uh, do you have website, uh, social media? What's, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a fan of old-fashioned Twitter. Um, oh. And my, my Twitter is William One. And is that going? Can you hear it going off in the back? I'm trying to stop it. Oh, that's it. <laughs> Kill that. Um, but yeah, I'm, um, yeah, I, but I, all social media really. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, I think it's, I think it's extraordinary these days. You are supposed to interact with the readers, isn't it? Well, yeah, yeah. If it's the way it goes, you know. It's, yeah, uh, no, it's, it's good. Yeah. It's, um, but uh, what a weird, you know, I'm, as I said, I'm quite old from an era when you're supposed to just be in a garret as a writer. Yeah, and, um, yeah. <laughs> and I think it, the landscape's changed in so many ways that are really interesting. I think books have changed what they do completely. Um, that thing when I got obsessed with going around writers' groups, readers' groups. Books are social objects now, aren't they? You read a book mm-hmm. and then you you'll talk about it with other people, and it's sort of like you can talk to weird people you'd never have anything in common with, but you can talk to them because <laughs> you've read the same book. And people are doing that these days. It's it's. Uh, it's Dangerous stuff. Sounds like a, sounds like a book signing. <laughs> 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 well, that's for me anyway. Um, yeah. Anyway, so um, and your website would be or do you have William to... WilliamShaw dot com? Well, that's an easy one. You know, I had that. I bought that in nineteen ninety five, maybe. I was very early, wow. but I had a book out in uh, then, and I just thought I should have a website, probably even earlier, actually. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. So, yeah, and then I sort of put it behind. There's some very famous William Shaw's around now, and I bet they're all, you know, dying to have my website, but well, they you can't make, so you can make your, you know, sell it. Yeah. <laughs> well, if the, book, if the whole thing, if the whole book thing. Yeah, if it doesn't work out. 
<laughs> so, how was how was the last couple of years with COVID for you in writing? And I ask that not that you're going to put COVID into your stories, but I'm thinking more in the terms of um, when there's all that weirdness going around, like you guys had the Brexit, and yeah, you know that then you've got a lot of political stuff, and you got all this turmoil, and then we've got. You just with everything going on now, the COVID on top of it, and everyone's supposed to stay home. And you got the anti-mask rallies. You got all this stuff going on. Does that stress outside of your house seep into your writing? When I was a journalist, I used to think that you should be able to write anywhere and under any circumstances. And you know, I I used to choose the weirdest laptop so I could work on a seven-hour plane journey. You know, because Laptops only worked for three hours, didn't they? You know, and yeah. I used to find these really low-powered things that you could write for ages. And and I, you know, then when I had children, I'd be journalists, and they'd come and talk to me about everything they'd done in school. I didn't hear a word. And yeah. so I'm really good at shutting the world out. So I've kind of been in preparation for COVID for a long time. And I think <laughs> the, the writers divided between those who who couldn't do that and those who could and I did really well until this last year actually and I've been writing a novel and it's been a pig and I think at some point actually COVID was part of that I just think at some point the stress of it all and the strangeness does seep in and I actually it's the hardest book I've ever written this 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 last one and I can't think of any reason why it is apart from the fact that at some point I just probably began to feel a bit disturbed by it all but up till then I'd shut it out just like I've managed to shut out the children and stuff oh, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it crept in and I think you know maybe that was a bit harder so it's been interesting isn't it because I bet you get totally various an- answers to that question oh yeah there's there's ones that just can get right into their writing and they don't care what's going on outside of them and it's like an escape and and all that then there's others that are completely shut down can't write it really affected me too in that way yeah. um, because I have to be in the right mood or have to feel it. Otherwise, it just it's it's like work then. And so, if I'm under a timeline, yeah, then I have to work. But it's not the same. Um, but when you say as a journalist, like how you have to be able to write under any condition, anywhere, any time, because that's what you do. <laughs> but I think that fits with the journalist. Like if I'm writing about some hurricane, or I'm I'm on some. I'm in a bank and everyone's being held up and I'm reporting about it. My emotion will be part of that report. It fits. Right. But but if um, you've got something going outside of your house that's really uh, stressing, it doesn't really fit necessarily when you're writing like the trawler man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think that's kind of um, what I mean. I just wonder if, if it's something we're not going to realize for maybe 10, 10 years or, or 20 yeah. years. I think, like you know, a lot of my colleagues have are from, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I've got Irish descent, and uh, a lot of my colleagues are from from Ireland and things like that. When we had a big, you know, for many many years, we had a, you know, catastrophic thing happening in Ireland uh, in, in the troubles it's in the north of Ireland. What's really interesting that didn't pr- produce fiction for twenty thirty years, because yeah. there was no way to write about something that big in a way that fiction suited because fiction's got to be able to not be dogmatic about stuff it's got to be able to sort of leave space for uncertainty in in the telling of stuff like that you can't it's not political in that there may be politics in the books but it's, you've got to have that you've got to process it before you can actually turn it into stories in a weird way and and then but after about 20 years suddenly this this you know, richness of books began to emerge from that. And I think we'll probably be that. I mean, I think most of us are now mentioning that COVID had happened because it functionally affects our plots. But I don't think we processed what it means in that kind of way yet. Right, right. Yeah, you know, uh, who knows what even the the children now that are uh, living through it as children, how they'll grow up and what they'll write, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, probably Definitely. something like Charles Manson or something. <laughs> 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 well... It's, it's always good talking to you um, again. Um, now, the book everyone needs to pick up, it's called The Trollerman. And this is a very important book to get, okay? Now, the author is our guest, William Shaw. Thank you for being here. Thank you. What a pleasure. Thanks, William. Tired of wasting time trying to decide what to watch on your streaming service? Go to our website and look for the Martino Movie Reviews. 
To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.